talk about dependencies. Again, my name is Blake Miserani. I go by B Miserani on Twitter and GitHub. I've been doing Go since around 2009, so that's almost five years now, I'm going on six. Um, and I spent most of my time writing Go at Heroku. I worked on a project called Doozer. How many of you have heard of Doozer? How many of you used it in production? That's good. That's good. <laughs> um, but yeah, most of my time writing Go at Heroku is spent writing Go for distributed systems. And how many of you work on distributed systems or use Go to do distributed systems? Great, it's, it's really wonderful for that. So a story. One Sunday afternoon, I was at a friend's barbecue, met some new friends of his that I hadn't met before. And they began talking to me, or telling me about how they knew Tom, because I had asked them. And they were explaining that they had spent quite a bit of time with Tom, who was, who was throwing the barbecue, uh, at the rock climbing gym. And I was intrigued. I had known that you know, Tom had done some rock climbing, but I didn't realize he had gone so much. And I was curious to learn more about rock climbing, so I asked them lots of questions, and lots of questions, and I asked them what it was like. And one of them said, well, there's this place called Dog Patch Boulder, so I immediately pulled my phone out, and I googled Dog Patch Boulders. And if you've ever seen an indoor rock climbing gym, they're beautiful, they're like full of colors and all these interesting items, and I was immediately hooked. I was immediately interested, and I had basically told myself that I am now a rock climber. This is what I do, it's my thing. So Monday, <laughs> Monday I'm at the sports store and I'm going through looking for new shoes. I hate shopping for shoes, but this particular day I was incredibly, exci I was incredibly excited about. I began learning all sorts of interesting things about these shoes, but really what I learned was I just wanted, I wanted to know what the best was. I wanted, I didn't really care, I didn't listen too much to what the clerk was telling me or what the, 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 the young lady who she was, she was ex trying to explain why I should learn more about these shoes and understand more about what I'm getting myself into first, but I ignored her. And so she, she, read, she showed me this shoe. And this shoe, this is a beginner shoe. You can see like the, the sole is flat. There's, there's quite a bit of a wider tip to the, to the toe. And there's just, you know, some simple Velcro straps on the top. This is, a, this is more of a comfortable shoe. It's great for a beginner. But I kind of, my eyes wandered on, and I moved on to this shoe. It was yellow, it was beautiful, it was, it was bright and vivid, and it said, I climb rocks. So <laughs> I became a little more attached to this shoe, and she told me, you know, she was telling me, okay, well, this one's a little more, you know, like, you know, once you get into rock climbing, then maybe you, after a while, you might want to look at this. I was like, yeah, well, how much is it? It's just, it's like 10 bucks more, okay. You know, maybe I'll take this one, but oh, wait, what is this shoe? <laughs> this one looks badass. <laughs> Look, it's got this arch. What is that? And she goes, well, that's, that's really, that's, that's a higher end one, and that's leather, and then it's got different qualities to it, and it's, but it's really, it's more for aggressive rock climbing. And she used the word aggressive. <laughs> so I pulled out my credit card, and, because I figured that the more money I spent on an aggressive shoe, that had to be the better shoe. That was the shoe I needed. After all, rock climbing's my thing now, right? <laughs> so here's what she neglected to tell me, probably because she was tired of me constantly interrupting her and ignoring her. And what happens when you wear this shoe and you haven't been rock climbing long enough and your toes aren't strong enough and your feet and your tendons aren't strong enough, but mainly your toes aren't used to being in that cramped little position like a ballerina, you get, you get some nasty toes <laughs> very quickly. So I quickly ran back to the store and bought this shoe, which I then continued on with for quite some time. But this story kind of repeats itself in almost everything that uh, a lot of us do, and, and even myself, you know, whenever I get into a, something new, I'm, I'm so anxious to learn and, and to just, just immerse myself in it that I, I tend to choose inappropriate footwear for the occasion, for my entrance into this new world. And it, it really, it, it, it holds me back, right? And it, it holds you back when you do this, but it's, it's something that 
if you learn to understand or learn to catch yourself doing it, you can avoid it. And, and avoiding it means less pain. So I want to talk about the three fallacies, not the three fallacies, there's many fallacies to dependencies, <laughs> but I want to talk about three that I, I commonly run into when, um, when working with people who are new to Go and when they come into Go and uh, how I help them or what the things that I usually tend to show them um, and, and, and explain why that way of thinking isn't really um, conducive to, to, to learning Go and, and excelling at Go. So let's play a little game. It's called Spot These, Spot These Fallacies. How many of you have heard this one or said this one? Go is doing it wrong. They don't know what, what's, what's going on in Go. It, doesn't, it lacks all of these things. Where's the generics? Okay, I threw that out there. Am I the first speaker to mention that? Okay. I really don't care about generics. I just had to say that. Um, but what's really happening is that Go is, Go is doing the, that thing their, its way. And it's the Go. It's more of a Go way of doing it. It's not that it's doing it wrong. It's just doing it different. And that you're in a new language now. And you're, you're experiencing something new. And, and instead of trying on, you know, instead of reaching for the aggressive shoe, Instead, you could step back, put your cozy shoes on, and, and try and learn a little bit first. And so usually this leads to, or, or starts with, uh, faces like this. There's Why doesn't Go have this library? I want it now. Why don't I have this? I need, there's, there's absolutely no way I can be productive in this until I write this library, because obviously Go and the whole community of Go is going to be absolutely grateful for the fact that I'm about to write this library and unleash it on them and they will all be so much more productive because of it. That behavior is obnoxious. Speaking of obnoxious, all right, I'm gonna talk about my past, Ruby. Um, so in Ruby, there's this thing called RSpec. How many of you have heard of it? Okay, so RSpec did some gross overuse of interesting features in Ruby. One of which was to install a method called should on every single object in the universe. And should would return an object that overloaded the equivalency operator, the equal equal, so that you could compare things to see if they were equal. And then if they weren't equal, it would then uh, report that to the, re to the report, the, the testing report, so that you could see either a dot or a failure. The interesting thing about this, though, is that when you run, run this through Ruby with the warnings turned on, Ruby tells you you're doing something possibly useless. <laughs> why, are you, why are you checking the equivalency of something, of, of these two things, but not doing anything with the, with the true or the false? And so your build servers tend to look like this, because you have them all over. This is how you do your assertions. So I looked around for a while, and I thought, OK, well, this is kind of annoying. I want to get rid of all these messages. Um, how do I do that without turning warnings off? Um, so I Googled around, and I found that someone had, had figured out, found a way to do this. You simply define a method called assert that took some variadic number of parameters, some inputs, did absolutely nothing with them, returned absolutely nothing. But if you put that in front of, <laughs> the warnings would go away. <laughs> so now, when I run Ruby with warnings on, I no longer get these warnings. But then I thought, well, that's interesting. What if we took this assert that I have to do anyway, that I have to write anyway to get rid of these warnings, and I added two, very, you know, two inputs to it, what I wanted and what I, you know, what I expected and what I got, and I just checked to make sure that if they were equal or not, and if they didn't, fail. Well, then I could call the method to look like this. And then I could get rid of this dependency, this massive dependency called RSpec. Anyway, where were we? All right, Go's doing it wrong. So, <laughs> so obviously I had to write an assert library back in 2010 because Go was doing it wrong. I, I, I needed my asserts. I came from the land of Ruby and, well, there were no asserts. <laughs> so, I wrote this library clocks in at around 89 lines of code. And let me tell you what that 89 lines of code buys you. It buys you this method. 
that allows you to check if two things are equal. And if they aren't, it will print the message that you pass in as the last parameter to standard out. Thank you. <laughs> but then if you kind of think through this a little bit more, I started to realize, mainly because my colleague Keith at the time had convinced me that this was really, really kind of idiotic. I probably shouldn't have written this library. Um, I realized that, you know, what if equal just returned whether or not these two things were equal? Then I could just put it in an if statement and in the block I could print out my own custom message that way too. <laughs> I mean the custom message would look something like this. I could use the error f on, on testing. That's, that's convenient. So like if we take a look at that, we can, we can go a little further. It's a little bit further. Let's hold on. We can use this operator, and now when we run, when we look at it as a whole, we realize that, oh, it's, it's okay, this is accomplishing the same thing. Cool. <laughs> Interesting. So when I run go imports, it removes this dependency. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> The second biggest fallacy I see is predetermination. The idea that you already expect or you, you know going into it before the first line of code is written that you're going to need these specific dependencies. That you, you, you absolutely, there's, there's no, no ifs, ands, or buts. You've figured it all out. Let's start importing external packages. Let's start go getting things. So, generally, this one starts out as something like NetHttp is lacking. We're obviously going to need to do more things. We're going to need something to do more for us. And then I always kind of squint and I go, okay, what you said, that's what you said, but what I heard was, I don't want to use an if statement. <laughs> I don't want to use a for loop. You're not all laughing anymore. I feel like maybe this is something a lot of you do. <laughs> Um, so to, to, better, to better explain this and to, to better to try and think through, through this reasoning, I want to compare a, um, a popular library, a popular, um, yeah, I want to compare a popular library to what it might look like, what its equivalent might look like just using the standard library. And this is not to pick on anyone, but the one, uh, one of the most popular right now is Gorilla. So, in Gorilla, one of the main examples that they show on, the, on, their, on their homepage is you'll see that they're, they're, they're matching this path that takes this, that, that has this uh, optional key at the end and matching it to this product handler. But then it goes a little bit further and it matches on host as well and on methods and on the scheme. So let's kind of move through this one by one and, and, and see what this might look like if we were to do it in just regular net HTTP and forego using Gorilla. So in order to match on domain and on the path and match that to a particular handler, HTTP, the, the net HTTP serve mux can already deal with domains. If you start the path with the do, without a slash and you just start it with a domain instead, it knows that that's the domain that it, can, it will only match for that particular domain followed by the explicit path that you've given it. And it'll execute that handler. So we've got that solved. So to get the key, the key that's in the path, the, the easiest way to do that using Go is to simply slice the prefix off of the path and whatever remains is your key. Is everybody still with me? Okay. This is very boring code. That's good. <laughs> so the methods. So this one gets a little interesting. So at first, I, I had actually written a, a I, I wrote a library called Pat, which does pattern muxing as well and does like Sinatra style routing for Go. I used it once and never again. I wrote it about, about 2010, I think is when I released it. 
Um, but one of the first things I did, but one of the things that it did was it, it, would, it would automatically determine if it should return a 405 or not, which is a method not allowed. And that means that if there's no handler for a particular method, then it knows that it should just return a 405. And that seemed really convenient until I realized it wasn't. Um, because, like in Gorilla 2, the problem is, is that based on this, I don't have, I'm matching get and post to one handler. So how do I know which method I'm responding to inside the handler? I have to write a select statement. So, so looking at this, I'm thinking, well, I'm not really quite sure what this is buying me right now. Like, is, am, I, am I getting a return on my investment here? I just pulled in this dependency. Is it, is it doing, doing enough for me right now? And in this case, I'm realizing, well, I've already got to write this select statement. If I just add a default, I can get the 405. So what I, and at the no, there's a note here that says, like, you need this in Gorilla too. And so this means that you can't just, this isn't, this isn't something that you would do with Algorilla. It's something you have to do with Gorilla as well. So keep that in mind. In order to do this in Gorilla without with having two different handlers, I would have to build up two different routes like this. But instead of doing this, I can add my default, and this. Oh, well, I can add. add I can. I can add the default. Sorry, and get the 405. So, so the scheme. This one's pretty easy. How many of you would write an if statement inside the handler to check what the what the schema was? Scheme. You? You? Well, I realized that actually all I had to do was mount it to the thing that's listening on, listening on SSL. Now I know it's always on SSL. So I never actually have to check. So my handler looks like this. I'm able to get the key from the product, from the, from the products path. I switch on the method. I do the get stuff, or I do the post stuff, or I return a 405. And that's it. I'm now able to remove 2,200 lines of code worthy, worth of dependency from my vendor directory. Everybody still with me? <laughs> so fallacy number three. This one I see all the time. I find it incredibly annoying. It's this one. If it's on GitHub, it's ready for production. <laughs> There was an email thread. Um, Keith had, uh, was trying to get some feedback from the community on GoDep and, and rewriting import paths um, by default. And he sent out this, this email, this post to the mailing list. And there was definitely like what, what we both expected, a little bit of pushback on it. And someone had come in and I, they, were, they were upset because that they, they didn't want to have to vendor everything and rewrite everything by default, that this was quite annoying, and they had all these different things, and they actually said in there that, that they really didn't care, or they didn't want to see any of this, they kind of wanted to sweep it under the rug, all these dependencies. And so then I, I, I believe Dave Cheney quoted me and tweeted this as well, I said, <laughs> I said, you don't pick up random items on the street and attempt to eat them, I hope, so why not follow that same room with dependencies? And I feel like that's kind of the way a lot of people approach dependencies and go is they come in and the first thing they do is they just go looking for all these things that already have, have been written for them and then assume that everything's just working because it's already there and then just mash it all together. And then they wind up with three lines of go code that they wrote themselves and then like this three, you know, 18,000 lines of, of, of dependency code when it could have been brought down and concise and maybe they would have written seven or eight more lines of code but could have not had all those dependencies. So I want to leave you with this, and that is that I believe that most Go programs do not require external dependencies. If you just think, think about it a little bit and just take, take a little bit of time to realize what it is you're trying to accomplish by bringing this external dependency in. Or maybe one thing, one technique I like, one strategy is to go ahead and bring that import in, and when GoDep writes it out to the vendor directory and you have to check it into source control, you'll see that massive green diff. And then you kind of make you think, well, what, what in there am I actually using? What code paths are being touched? And, and most of the time, you'll notice that it's only just a few. It's a very small little path and it's pretty shallow. And it's something that you could just copy and paste and bring in and give proper attribution. Um, but 
it's, it's usually that easy, and then you can get rid of the, the rest of everything that it came with. So please, avoid these fallacies. Enjoy simpler programs. Thank you. <laughs>